Hello everyone. In my last video, I began creating this little game where you fly around a miniature version of the world, delivering packages to various cities. It was a lot of fun to work on, and I was also amazed by how many people were interested in the project, so I've decided to continue experimenting with it and see where things go. But first, there's a problem. The game runs fine on my computer, but it seems other computers are not so fond of it. This message likes to pop up right at the beginning, saying that the machine hasn't heard anything from the GPU in a while, so it's going to try turning it off and on again. Unsurprisingly, this crashes everything. To try to figure it out, I started by setting the resolution of everything extremely low so that it would actually run on my little test device, and then one by one I switched them back to full resolution until that error showed up again. The main culprit turned out to be a compute shade I had written that takes all the country outlines and fills them in with the index of each country. If you've seen the last video, you might remember how that was used to highlight the countries as you fly over them, and also to figure out which country your packages have actually landed in. So I could spend who knows how many hours trying to optimize that code, but since it does run fine for me, I decided to just save the result as a regular image file, which can then simply be loaded in instead of having to actually compute it each time. I then made a few other optimizations here and there before trying it out once again on my test device. Hopefully this is going to work, and it does seem to be running fairly well. Admittedly, one of my optimizations was just turning off the clouds, which I guess is kind of cheating, but I'll need to revisit those later because they're really slow. Now, something that's been bothering me a bit is the quality of the color map. I do have it on the largest allowed size here, a whopping 16,000 pixels across, but considering how much ground it has to cover, that's not actually that big. The original map I downloaded is made up of 8 tiles, each with a size of about 21,000 square pixels. I'm going to compromise a bit and scale each of them down to around 8,000 square pixels instead, which doubles the resolution we had before. This does not take up a fairly hefty 256 megabytes of graphics memory, but I really want that extra detail and crispness. While I'm at it, I think I'll also switch maps from February to September, just so it's a little less snowy. I then also want to take the height map and use it to regenerate the normal map we created last video at this higher resolution. I really love looking at this normal map because it gives such a nice sense of the shape of the terrain with the added bonus of some pretty funky colours. Here's a closer look at the higher resolution natural colours, as well as the heights for this region. But the normal map is really the one that I could stare at for hours. As I was meandering about, my eye was drawn to this mysterious swirly shape in West Africa, which I have noticed before but somehow failed to investigate. Looking it up, I learned that it's this incredible looking structure of concentric rings, known rather poetically as the Eye of the Sahara. Now something I've been wanting to experiment with actually is rendering a tiny piece of the earth in much greater detail, and this seems like a good excuse to try that. So I'm using the Earth Explorer here to track down the height map tiles for this particular region around the eye. The data here has been captured with a resolution of 3 arc seconds, which translates to about 90 meters per pixel, so downloading every height tile would be hundreds of gigabytes of data. Anyway, here's the map I'm going to use. This is an area of about 540 square kilometers, going from black at sea level to white at an elevation of around 900 meters. After some tweaks to the mesh generator to create a flat plane instead of a sphere, here's the result. Like before, the heights have been exaggerated so we can see things more clearly. I think I did maybe about 8-fold vertical exaggeration. Now, I'd like to try flying around a bit, but it turns out my code for that has a hard time coping with the concept of a flat earth. I've quickly been working on fixing that though, and we can finally now head out across the sands on an expedition to the eye. I 
I initially assumed it was an impact crater because it reminded me of some of the images I looked at while researching craters for my old procedural planets project. But apparently it was formed by natural terrestrial processes. I have no idea how that happens, but I'm glad it did because it looks stunning. I've quickly done one more test, this time in southern Africa. I'm pretty happy with the detail of the height maps, but I haven't yet figured out how to get my hands on equally detailed colour maps, because if I disable the interpolation here, you can see just how blocky it is at this extremely zoomed in scale. Still, it's pretty fun to fly around these mountains here. I'd love to be able to have the entire world at this scale, but that would obviously involve dynamically streaming the data in as you're playing, which is not something I feel like tackling at the moment. So I'll leave this experiment here for now, and see if I can remember what we were doing before I got sidetracked with all of this. Okay, so we have these eight colour tiles which now need to be mapped to a sphere. We also have this little function for converting a latitude and longitude to a point on a sphere, so we could just use that to wrap up each of the eight tiles like so. But if we look at the triangles of the underlying mesh, they look good around the equator, but get really pinched and distorted near to the poles. So last video we made something called a cube sphere, which we then chopped up into 96 separate pieces to help with rendering performance, the idea being that any pieces that are off the screen can quickly be discarded. So we need to match each of those up with the correct portion of the correct colour tile. My first attempt at this had some subtle issues which I was worried might bother the geography boffins out there. So I kept tinkering and tinkering and eventually came up with this bit of code. Here we begin by setting up our 8 texture tiles, and then once all 96 little mesh pieces have been created, we loop through them and find their centre points each of which then gets converted to a latitude and longitude using this inverse function up here. We can then do some simple maths to figure out which of the tiles each point landed on, which lets us assign the correct texture to each mesh. I'm never quite sure if the words I'm saying make any sense, so here's a little animation that shows essentially what the code is doing. Now if we just draw these textures the same way as before, it's not going to quite work out. We need to adjust the shader to something like this, so that each mesh displays the correct little portion of its texture. Here are the texture coordinates we just calculated, and if we use those, at last we have the correct result. So we can now fly around our higher resolution world, and I'm not sure if the difference will be all that noticeable on video, but the textures do look significantly crispier when actually playing it, so I'm glad we went to the trouble. It also allowed me to scale the world up a bit without things getting too blurry, so I've made it about 50% bigger than before. I also want to mention a small but very annoying issue that I finally fixed. If you look closely, you can see that the plane appears to be vibrating, and it's been bugging me pretty much since the beginning of the project. I eventually tracked it down to these two lines of code for rotating the camera to look at the player, and by just replacing those with a call to this built-in look at function, suddenly everything was silky smooth. I don't understand what was going wrong there, but right now I'm just happy it's fixed. Alright, now something I've been itching to do for a while is make cities light up at night, and so I've started by downloading this nice map of city lights. I'll first try simply drawing this straight onto the terrain, and let's see how that looks. One problem I'm noticing with this is that on steep terrain the lights get stretched out which looks pretty strange, and overall it's just not quite looking how I want. I think it might fit the style I'm going for better if the lights were all individual points, which means it's time to break out the compute shaders again. So this code here gets run for every light we want to create, and it basically just loops a bunch of times and picks different random points on a sphere. At each of these random points, it looks up the brightness of the corresponding pixel in the light map, and keeps track of which point had the highest value, ultimately recording the winner in the city lights buffer over here. Then using GPU instancing, I'm going to draw little spheres at each of these points with this shader. 
We start off in here by getting the light that's currently being drawn, and then calculate a sort of time value where 1 means midday and negative 1 means midnight. We can then set the colour based on the light's intensity, and make it only appear when our time value is below a certain threshold. Finally, there's just some stuff for positioning the mesh vertices, and sending that data along to eventually be rendered over here. So let's try this out. Currently it's daytime, so no lights are visible, but if we rotate the sunlight over here, we should see some city lights starting to appear. We can play around with the size of these a bit. I think they're too big at the moment, so I'll scale them down a little. Something like that, maybe. And then all of them are currently bright white, so I'm going to tweak the dim colour over here to something more orangeyish red. I think that looks okay. What doesn't look so good though is this harsh boundary where the lights switch from on to off. But that should be easy to fix. I'll just go back to the compute shader where we are creating the lights, and give each of them a random value, which will affect the time that they turn on. For completeness sake by the way, here's the code I'm using for generating all these pseudo-random numbers. Anyway, let's then hop back over to the shader we're using to draw the lights, and in here we can just add in that random value to give some variation to when the lights turn on. Let's go test that quickly. So here we still have our hash line like before, but if we increase the amount of time variation we should see that getting broken up with a bit of randomness, which I think looks a lot better. I've gone and made a few small tweaks, and added a bloom effect which basically just takes the brightest parts of the image, blurs it and then adds it back on top of the original image, to give us this nice glowy effect. I followed this really nice tutorial to implement that, if you're interested in the details. Anyway, I think I'll fly around a bit now and enjoy the lights while I try to figure out what I want to work on next. Alright, so I've decided to spend some time optimizing the world mesh. You can see if I switch on the wireframe view, the whole thing pretty much turns black because there are a lot of vertices in here. But while I've harped on previously about evenly distributing points on a sphere, in reality we don't need nearly as many points to describe the oceans or flat areas of terrain as we do for detailed mountainous regions for example. But as it stands, if I want lots of vertices in the mountains, then I have to have lots of vertices everywhere, which is why the world currently has a monstrous 8.6 million of the things. So I want to try drastically reduce that number, which is very easy, while preserving the perceived detail of the mesh, which makes it somewhat less easy. But I've got a few ideas for how to tackle it, so I'm going to mess around a bit and see what happens. Well, this is what happened. I do think it's pretty interesting looking, but not quite what I was going for. Alright, I've made some alterations, hopefully it will turn out better this time. Uh, there are some small areas where it almost seems to work, but most of it is just nonsense. I have an idea though. Nope, that didn't help at all. Ok, let's skip over a few frustrating hours. I've now written this little compute shader, and it begins by just generating points on a sphere using the exact same cube sphere approach we've been using so far. Then for each point, it looks up the height of the terrain, as well as the heights at four surrounding points. We can then calculate an error value, which is just the difference between the height of the current point and the average height of its neighbours. Finally, if that error is greater than some threshold, which tells us that it's not a very flat region of terrain, then we add the current point to be used in the mesh. Also, since this is taking place on a sphere, even completely flat terrain is actually curved, so I've specified this underlying grid so that points can't get spaced too far apart. 
So I'll run that quickly, and here we can see the points generated for one of the terrain faces. At the moment, the error threshold is set to zero, which is why it looks the same as before. But if I increase that value just a little, you can see the Atlantic Ocean here has immediately lost most of its points, since the height values there are all zero. So that's again why I have this grid size here, to make sure we get enough points to render these flat regions nicely. Let me increase the error threshold a little further, and we can see more and more points being removed. So that's obviously something we can play with, to try strike a balance between detail and performance, along with the resolution up here. Now, these points still need to be connected up as triangles in order for them to actually be rendered. This is a problem I'd love to learn more about, but for now I'm just going to be relying on the excellent triangle library, or more precisely the c -sharp version of it, to solve the problem for me. There were some small squabbles at the start, but once those were ironed out, it worked very nicely. So here we can quickly take a look at the triangulation it's generating from our points. And here's what it looks like with the full terrain, which has come down from about 9 million vertices to just over 1 million now. I should mention, by the way, there are much cleverer solutions for this kind of thing, where the vertices are continually updated based on the distance from the camera and so on, and I would like to learn how to implement those techniques, but that's something for another day. For now, let's just zoom in over here so we can get a closer look, and I'm pretty happy with that. The more flat regions have obviously lost some detail, but all that's important really is that the mesh captures the silhouette of the terrain, because once we add our normal map back in, that's going to take care of all the little lighting details. We don't need to capture all of that with geometry. One downside with this new method though is it takes quite a while to generate the world, about 20 seconds or so, so I wrote a bit of code that just saves the vertex positions and triangle indices to a big file, so it can very quickly be loaded in when the game starts. Alright, something I'd like to try adding to the game is wind, so I'm going to grab some forecast data from the US Weather Service, and that comes in some unfamiliar format, so I'm using a little utility here to convert it into a nice simple JSON file. Here's what that data looks like. First it introduces itself, and lets us know we're going to be looking at the U component of the wind, which I guess is the velocity along one axis. And if we scroll down a bit, here are the actual values. If we scroll all the way down to the middle, we should find the other axis of the velocity, and these are all in meters per second, it says. I've gone ahead and written some very uninteresting code to load these values into a texture, so let's see what comes out of that. In this little shader here, I'll quickly read the wind vector from the texture, and let's maybe output the speed of the wind, so I'll get the vector's length, and divide it by the maximum speed in the file, which was about 25 meters per second. And here's what that looks like. I find it really interesting how clearly defined the shapes of the continents are. I guess it does make sense that the wind would experience a lot more friction over the land and slow down, but it's very dramatic. Let's go back to the shader quickly, and maybe we could try drawing the direction of the wind in red and green like this. That's pretty cool looking I think, but what I'd really like to do is spawn in some particles, and have them actually move around the globe based on this vector field. So I've been writing a little compute shader, and in here we have this particle update kernel which runs for every particle, and simply gets the wind velocity at the particle's current position using this function up here, which does some little calculations to convert the 2D velocity into a velocity on a sphere. That velocity then just gets used to update the particle's position. There's also a timer for each particle, and once it reaches zero, the particle gets respawned in this function at the top, which just creates a seed from the particle's index and current position, and uses that to generate a new random position for it. And it also resets the timer, of course. So here's our little globe, and I've coloured this based on the wind speed, with lighter shades of blue representing higher speeds. Let's go ahead and spawn in some particles, and see what happens. Well, there's a pleasant surprise, this actually seems to be working. 
there's even a cyclone over here, and it's rotating counterclockwise, which I had to look up is what they're supposed to do in the northern hemisphere. So that's a nice confirmation that I didn't get anything back to front in the velocity calculations at least. And if we go over to the southern hemisphere, here we can see the cyclones twisting around in the opposite direction. It's surprisingly entertaining to just watch these points flowing around. It would be nice to see the weather actually evolving over time though, and I guess I could blend between data from different days to do that. I'd also love to try to do some kind of fluid simulation to generate believable weather patterns, but those are challenges for some other time. Right now, I'm not even sure how I want to actually implement this into the game. I've played around a bit with the old cloud system, getting them to move about based on the wind, and then perhaps the player's speed could be affected by the winds as well. The trouble is just that I'm not really happy with how this is looking, and I'm struggling at the moment to figure out how to go about improving it. But there are so many other aspects of the project I'm excited to work on that I think I might just leave this experiment here for now and come back to it later whenever inspiration decides to strike. So let's move on to a little detail I've been wanting to add for a while. The moon. So I'll grab a colour map of the moon, and while we're at it, I guess we might as well grab this height map as well, because we can use the same code from last video to generate a normal map from it. Have I mentioned I love looking at normal maps? Only the world space ones though, there are some good technical reasons for preferring tangent space maps, but then you don't get the pretty colours which are much more important to me. Anyway, we can slap these on a sphere, and just like that we have ourselves a moon. Let's now get this into orbit. So after referring to this little diagram, I've written some code that starts off by calculating the moon's orbital plane, and then just makes it move around in a circle on that plane. Lastly, it tilts the moon a tiny bit, and makes it spin on its axis in synchrony with its orbit, so that the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. Let's see how that looks. So because the moon's orbiting at this angle, when looking at it from the Earth, we'll sometimes be able to see a bit more of the top, and sometimes a bit more of the bottom, and that gives the appearance that the moon is rocking back and forth. But it should also appear to rock from side to side, and change size over time, because the moon's orbit is actually slightly elliptical. This is much more detail than is necessary for the game, but I'm not in any particular rush and it sounds like fun, so let's do it anyway. In one of my old videos, I played around with some simple orbital simulations, and this here was a simulation using Newton's equation of gravity. What's nice about this approach is that we can simulate the interactions of as many bodies as we want, but on the other hand it can be a bit finicky, and also if you want to know the position of a body at a certain moment in time, you have to run the whole simulation up until that time to find it out. So today I'd like to try a different approach. Say we have one big stationary body, and a second little body that orbits the first. Technically they'd both be orbiting their shared centre of mass, but I'm going to ignore that for today. Now one way to define the shape of the orbit is with two values, called the periapsis, which is this distance of closest approach, and the apoapsis, which is the distance of the furthest point in the orbit. Those two bits of information together define an ellipse, and I've written a bit of code here to visualise that. So this just starts by calculating some properties of the ellipse, and it then generates a bunch of points along that orbit, and connects them up with the lines to display them on the screen. And we can see that here. Let me increase the apoapsis a bit, just to get a nice elongated orbit. What we need to do now is figure out where along this orbit the body will be at any moment in time. Thanks to Kepler, we know one very helpful fact, which is that as the body moves in its orbit, the area that it traces out in a certain amount of time will always be the same. So say this is how far it moves in one week, then over the course of the next week the distance it moves might be different, but the area it covers will be exactly the same. 
With the power of geometry, we can transform this fact into an equation which essentially relates where the body would be if its orbit was a simple circle to where it is on the actual ellipse. So of course, we'd like to solve the equation for this angle big E, but it turns out there's no exact way to do that. Instead, we can rearrange the equation here so that if it's given the correct value for that angle, the function will return zero. Now all we need to do is keep guessing values until one of them gets us at least close to zero, and that will be our approximation of the answer. We don't have to guess completely blindly, thankfully. We can use something like Newton's method, which I've implemented crudely over here, and how that works, along with much more cool stuff, is explained in this wonderful video. Alright, so to bring this all together is this function called calculate point on orbit, and all it really has to do is pass the Kepler equation into Newton's method, which should give us a very good approximation of the angle we want, and it then simply takes that angle and converts it to a point on the ellipse. Let's see how that goes. So here we can see our little satellite speeding up as it approaches the planet, whizzing past, and then slowing down as it moves further away. I'd say it's looking pretty good, so let's apply it to the moon. At its closest, the moon is about 360,000 kilometers from the Earth, and at its furthest, around 405,000 kilometers. So I'll quickly change the position calculation here to use our fancy new orbit code. Then I'd also like to add a little visualization. I am going to draw a white line from the moon to the center of the Earth, and a red line just going from the moon out in the direction it's facing. If we watch this orbiting now, we can see from the red line how the slight eccentricity of the orbit causes the moon's rotation around its axis to sometimes lag behind or shoot ahead of its orbit around the Earth. So if we look at the moon from the Earth again, we should see it not only looks like it's wobbling up and down, but also now from side to side. And of course, it appears to grow and shrink over time as well. This is far from super accurate what I've done, by the way. There are many details to take into account, but I did learn some new things, so I'd say it was worthwhile. Now, I thought I'd quickly set up the Earth's orbit around the Sun as well, and here we can see the Earth is currently tilted away from the Sun, at least in the Northern Hemisphere where our observer currently is. So if I change the time of day here, we can see the Sun appears pretty low in the sky. Fast forwarding about half a year though, we can see the Earth is tilted towards the Sun, which now appears much higher in the sky at the same time of day. Let's take a closer look at this apparent motion of the sun, and if we actually draw a trail behind it as we are stepping through the year in one day increments, we can see how that traces out this famous sort of figure eight, known as an analemma in the sky. I was curious about this one lobe being so much smaller than the other, and I learned that that's due to Earth's orbit also being slightly elliptical. So if I switch over here to a simple circular orbit instead, we can see how the sun still traces out the same basic shape, but the lobes have now been brought into balance. Here I've just brought the tilt of the Earth down to zero as well, and we can see how the sun now appears at the same spot in the sky every day. I thought that was quite fun to play with. Now that we have the sun, let's add in the rest of the stars. My first thought was to just map a giant texture like this one over the sky, but it didn't fit in very well. I then came across this nice compilation of star data, and I wrote a little script to load that in. There's over 100,000 entries in this thing, but one of the attributes is the star's apparent magnitude, so we can select only the ones that are bright enough to be visible with the naked eye. The code then goes on to just calculate the star's positions, and draws them as little spheres, which I'll need to optimize later. So over here we have about 9,000 stars, which I've given some test colors and sizes based on their brightness. This one here looks like the brightest of them all, which is Sirius. I'm incredibly bad at stars, recognizing constellations and all that stuff, so I'd need to consult a star chart to know if I've actually loaded these in correctly, but I'll just hope for the time being. One quick thing I could maybe check though is just if the North Star is actually in the North. So I think it should be right about here, 
and it is, so that's reassuring at least. Alright, so I'll bring the moon, sun and stars into the game soon, but I first want to finish up a rewrite I've been doing of my old atmosphere shader. It's still very similar to the original, so have a look at that video if you're interested in the details, but there are some nice little improvements and optimizations. For example, the original version did all the expensive ray matching calculations for every pixel on the screen, but this is now split up into two much cheaper steps. Firstly, since colours in the sky mostly change quite gradually, the sky can actually be rendered at a pretty tiny size and just scaled up. The biggest exception is the actual disk of the sun, so that's left out and just drawn separately on top at full resolution. The second step is for rendering the atmosphere over the terrain, which is trickier because the result depends on the depth of the terrain. The main trouble is that nearby pixels can have very different depth values, for example around the edges of mountains, so we'd get some unappealing artifacts there if we tried the same approach as with the sky. From this paper though, I learnt about a nice technique to get around that. What we can do is render the atmosphere again, but instead of just storing the end result like with the sky texture, we'll take two dimensional slices of what the result looks like at different depths, and store that in a three dimensional texture. Well, actually we need two three dimensional textures, because the result has two parts. There's the light from the sun that reaches us after scattering through the atmosphere, which is what we're looking at on the left here, but then there's also something called transmittance, which tells us how much of the light that's bounced off the terrain in the direction of the camera is actually going to reach the camera, because some of it will get scattered away as it travels through the atmosphere. Thankfully, these textures can be really tiny and still give good results, otherwise this obviously wouldn't be a very good optimization at all. Here's the code by the way where this is actually applied, so we first remap the terrain depth to a value between 0 and 1, and then that gets used to sample from the correct slice of the 3D textures. Or more precisely, it will be used to blend between the two closest slices to smooth things out a bit. Finally, over here, it's just applied to the terrain colour. So let's quickly see what this all looks like. Here we have just the light from the atmosphere by itself, then here are the transmittance values, and lastly the original colour from the terrain. The terrain's looking a bit flat at the moment, so let's now bring all the layers together, and we get this, which has a much better sense of depth, I think. Okay, let's finally have a look at what all this stuff we've been adding actually looks like in the game. So hopefully you've been able to see the stars twinkling in the background, and we should see those now slowly fading out as the sun begins to rise. I'll quickly veer off to the side here, because I want to show how we can see the shadow that the Earth casts on the atmosphere. It doesn't perfectly line up with the terrain unfortunately, because for annoying performance reasons the Earth is treated as a perfect sphere in the atmosphere ray matching loop. Anyway, as we head out over the ocean, you might notice I've added in some little wavy undulations onto the sphere here, just to try break up the perfect smoothness of the horizon, which I thought looked a bit strange on this miniature planet. This is done in the vertex shader just by offsetting the heights of the vertices a little bit based on some layers of simplex noise. As you can see, it's extremely crude. I would like to make it more lifelike, and I've actually already downloaded and processed some wave direction data, but I still need to figure out what exactly I'm going to do with that. In the meantime, I have made some other small improvements to the water. For example, most lakes appear pretty much completely black on the colour map I'm using, so I've tried to find alternative images of some of the larger lakes, and just fit them in as best I can. Let's hop back into our plane, and maybe go pay those lakes a visit. Perhaps we can even drop off some packages there, since that's still the only thing you can actually do in the game. I'm once again very guilty of neglecting the gameplay and just getting lost in all the little details. Still, some of you expressed interest last time in simply being able to fly about and see the sights, which is why I've tried to put at least some effort into optimization this episode. You'll probably still need a fairly powerful computer to run it, 
but I'll be making it freely available to download for anyone who'd like to give it a try. I'll also soon be making the source code available to everyone, in case some of you are interested in taking a closer look at that, or even adding your own features to it. Or fixing my bugs, of which I'm sure there are many. I've had a lot of fun building this so far, and even if this last episode was more about little tweaks and improvements than new exciting things, I hope it's still been interesting to follow the process. So thank you as always for watching, and until next time, cheers!